The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup is overflows with joy. I feast on His will trust in Jesus, and I will trust in Jesus, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will Welcome to our worship for the 15th of August. This morning we're going to share communion together, so I should stop the video now and go and get organised for that if you haven't already done so. Uh, we're going to do it as usual, we're going to use the same content as we'd be doing in the church itself. So whether you're with us in person or not, then you can join with us together as we worship God. Uh, so we'll sing, we'll pray and then we'll take communion together.
our reading this morning is the last reading in our series to do with positive words in the Bible. And I've chosen for our last week to look at the word contentment. So we're reading from Philippians chapter four. This is the first 13 verses. And it says this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So
A rich businessman was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing? he asked. Because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman. Well, why don't you catch more fish than you need? the rich man asked. What would I do with them? You could earn more money, came the impatient reply, and buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch more fish, and you could purchase nylon nets and catch even more fish and make more money, and soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman asked, well then what would I do? Well, you could sit down and enjoy life, said the industrialist. Well, what do you think I'm doing now? The fisherman replied as he looked out to sea. Well, for the last week, as I've said in this series, I've chosen the word contentment. It's defined in the dictionary as happiness, satisfaction, often because you have everything you need, ease of mind, peace, rest, gratification, fulfilment. And so it encompasses many of the words we've looked at over the past few weeks. In Philippians 4, we have a man who is sitting, not looking out at sea, enjoying life, but in prison, awaiting possible execution over false charges as he tells us how to find contentment. And his answer lies buried in the midst of a letter which is also a thank you note. The Philippian church had sent a financial gift to Paul, the prisoner, and he wants to express his heartfelt thanks. But at the same time, he doesn't want to give the impression that the Lord was not sufficient for his every need. Even though he had been and is in a very difficult situation, he's in prison, he doesn't want his donors to think that he'd been discontented before the gift arrived. But he does want them to know that their generosity is truly appreciated. So he combines his thanks with his lesson on the secret of contentment as he writes, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And he later expanded on this in his letter to Timothy, writing, this is 1 Timothy 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, or said, You say, if I had a little more, I should be satisfied. You make a mistake. If you're not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. So what is the secret of contentment? Well, according to Paul, it doesn't just happen. Paul writes, I have learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation. Some years ago, Duke University in the USA did a study on peace of mind or contentment. This wasn't a Christian study, but much of what it found will resonate with us today. And these were some of the factors they found that contributed greatly to emotional and mental stability and contentment. The first one was the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major feature in unhappiness. Well, Paul has sees some of the church in Philippi who he's writing to struggling with this. Eudea and Syntyche have fallen out, even though they've both worked with Paul in the past, and he pleads with them to be of one mind. This must have been a big enough disagreement that it reached Paul in prison many miles away. And he knew that it would not would affect not only them, but the whole church community. One of the challenges in any relationship is, of course, relationship. Whether it's in the family or church or work or anywhere else. We do pretty well here in St Leonard's, but learning to live together when we don't agree is vital. It's something that we need to continually practice. And we don't ever retire from our service of God. And when we change roles, we learn to be contented. We live in love. The second way of being contented is not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leading to depression. 
In the previous chapter, Paul has written, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what is he ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In our bereavement course, we've been looking at how the past affects us today, how the ways in which we've handled loss and separation, for instance, affect how we cope when someone dies and how we can feel guilt even when there is no reason for the feeling because of what we did or didn't do in the past. So when Paul talks about forgetting what's behind and pressing on, we don't pretend that our past didn't happen but we remember that it is the past and that it is forgiven. John wrote the words that we often quote at communion. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us for all, from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, the third thing on the Duke University list was not wasting time and energy fighting conditions you cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. Well, in our Bible passage, Paul is certainly learning this life lesson. He's in prison writing about rejoicing, about being thankful. He's thinking of others and not himself. You may be living with something or someone that is difficult at present. But contentment comes from living in the moment, not worrying about what might happen or what has happened. Paul wrote, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The situation may stay the same, but the peace of God can guard your heart and your mind. Number four is force yourself to stay involved with the world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and become reclusive during periods of stress. And here's Paul again, very much involved with the world, caring for others, serving the church. It's always tempting to think that others have it better than we do and that if we just had a little more or a different set of circumstances in our lives, then everything would be fine and we could get on with life. The story is told about the pilot who was always looking down intently on a certain valley in the Appalachians when the plane passed overhead. And one day his co-pilot asked, what's so interesting about that spot? And the pilot replied, see that stream? Well, when I was a kid, I used to sit down there on a log and fish, and every time an aeroplane flew over, I would look up and wish I was flying. And now, every time I fly over, I look down and I wish I was fishing. Number five is refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Accept the fact that nobody gets through life without sorrow and misfortune. Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell. He had as much reason as anyone to wallow in self-pity. But he could write, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And then cultivate the old fashioned virtues, love, humour, compassion and loyalty. Well, Paul began this letter by writing, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We looked at that a few weeks, couple of weeks ago, the fact that God can give us, will give us love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. Those virtues which the Duke University called the old fashioned virtues. Number seven out of the eight points was do not expect too much of yourself. When there is too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals you've set, feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. 
Philip Yancey writes of a spiritual seeker who interrupted his busy and acquisitive life to spend a few days in a monastery. I hope your stay is a blessed one, said the monk who showed him to his simple cell. If you need anything, let us know and we'll teach you how to live without it. And the study finished by saying, find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Self-centred, egotistical people score lowest on any test for measuring happiness and contentment. This university study wasn't done as a faith study, so it's interesting that faith, findings, believing in something, someone bigger than yourself, was the main thing they identified as the cause of contentment. Paul wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I read this week somebody writing, I'm thankful for, and this was their list, the taxes I pay because it means I have resources. The clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. A lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. The spot I find and use at the far end of the parking lot because it means I am capable of walking. My huge heating bill because it means I am warm. All the complaining I hear about the government because it means we have freedom of speech. The person behind me in church who sings off key because it means I can hear. The alarm that goes off in the early morning because it means that I'm alive and weariness and achy muscles at the end of the day because it means I've been productive. I'm sure you could add your own lists to that, items to that list as well as you sit here today in this moment because this moment is all that you have. In this moment you could just sink, sit here and think about the next moment, plan for the future. Or you could sit here and think about the past and mull over things that have happened before. And sometimes, of course, we have to do both of those things, plan for the future and we live with the past. But now, this moment is God's moment with you, with me, now. This moment, he can say to you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This moment, he can say to you, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So enjoy this moment. Be content with this moment. Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen.
communion together uh, in the church I'm putting up some words on the screen for the congregation to join in with in our usual practice the words that I put up that are written in white I say and the words in yellow the congregation repeat so even if you're on your own this morning listen to that maybe you could do the same thing as I'm going to put the same slides up on the screen here so let's join together to celebrate come to our God all who hunger for life for it is God who nourishes us at his table. Come to our God, all who are worn out by life, for it is God who provides the rest we need. Come to our God, all who are weighed down, for it is our God who carries our burdens with us. Eternal God, you sing a song of peace to our noisy hearts inviting us to still our fidgeting souls and find our rest, our peace and our joy in you. As we hand you our anger, our hurt, our sin, may our burdens become our songs of joy. May we find our rest, our hope in you. And so we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given th thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we can say together, Christ came that we may have life. Christ died so that the burden of death might be lifted from us. Christ was raised to new life so grace might be revealed to every generation. Christ will return to unite us with God through all eternity. So we take our bread and we eat, remembering that Jesus died for us. And then we take the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. And now let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this meal, which reminds us of the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. We thank you that he is our prophet, priest and coming king. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. When peace